And so he was trying to decide, okay, how did this happen? And so that's what this quote refers to is that these little itty bitty worms over a long period of time basically buried those cities. Um, or, you know, they, they till the soil and things drop down or the soil bounds up over them. And he did a number of experiments over several years. So, you know, this guy, um, it's really to be admired. I, I don't have the patience for it. But I mean, he would sit there and, and scope out worm burrows and put leaves to try to figure out, you know, is there a preferred way to pull leaves down into their burrows? And he discovered there was, you know, but he did all these hundreds of experiments over years. So it's really interesting, but I, so I just thought I would share that. That's a curious minds want to know thing. So earthworms, uh, there are basically two orders of worms. And um, yeah, supposedly worldwide, there's more than 4,500 uh, species. But here, when we look at the basic night crawler, which is what most of us are familiar with and what we think of when we think of earthworms, they're in the segmented worms, the annelids. Uh, so things like leeches are in there, you know, anything you think of that's, that's similar built. Uh, and they're in their own class, which is the clitellata, which has to do with the clitellum. And I'll show you that when we get to some pictures. Um, and then the subclass is, and I always say this wrong, Ogliochita. And this is, I put a little asterisk there because that's where the name for people who study earthworms comes from. So they're Ogliochitaologists, Chitologists. There you go. <laughs> So I, I stumble over that word, but that's actually a word and an area. So the reason they're in that class is because they have little bristles, not little stubby, what seem like little stubby legs, okay? So they've got bristles underneath them that serve to help with locomotion. So that puts them in that subclass, okay? And so the night crawler is basically Lumbricus terrestris. So, but, you know, they're not the only worm that's out there, or they're not the only earthworm. Earthworms uh, are, are different types, and they're classified, or they're lumped together based upon where they live. So, your red wigglers, which is your most common uh, composting worm, okay, they live primarily in the leaf litter on the surface of your garden. So, if you're, you know, weeding the flower beds or you're doing something in the garden and you move some leaves and you find some worms right there in that very, that leaf litter or right there in the very top of the soil, they're probably the red wigglers, okay? And they're basically what we call the composting earthworm. Then you have the night crawlers, which go down to, you know, they're deeper in the soil. They go down to about eight feet deep. And they primarily are the ones that, you know, kind of move things up and down uh, through the soil. Uh, they have the burrows that, you know, they aerate. They, they, the burrows, if you, you know, cut into them, you can actually see the burrows because they're lined with a mucus. And so they don't like just collapse. So it helps water percolate down into the, where the plant roots are. And uh, so it's good for water movement and it's also good for aeration. And then you have the, uh, the ones that live in the uh, plant roots, primarily trees. They're little tiny worms, but they stay associated with the roots of the plants. Okay. And so their primary role is in terms of uh, nutrient processing with uh, the roots. So those are the three primary categories of the worms. And I don't, you know, I'm merely gonna be talking about the red wigglers and night crawlers. So this is your basic earthworm. So if you look and you can kind of see if I can get my little, okay, it's not gonna let me do it. Okay, there we go. Can you see this right here? Oops, go back, go back, go back. Can you see what I'm pointing at? Yes, okay, that's the clitellum. And I'm gonna talk more about the clitellum later. It shows up best on the night crawlers. It's very obvious on a night crawler. Okay, and then you can kind of see down here how its tail's a little flatter. Um, so anyway, this is your basic earthworm. 
We're going to talk a little bit more about some of the features. And I remember when I was taking a science class, and I think this was in middle school. And it was, you know, my first class where we actually got to cut up stuff. and It was so cool. And so I think I told you all before when I did a, a training class on muscles, how I was surprised at muscles being more complicated than they look. Well, your earthworms are even more complicated than that. And so for such a simple creature, they're not so simple. And so, you know, they have a mouth that doesn't have any teeth. Basically what happens is they have a pharynx and it'll be in another picture when we look internally. And they push the pharynx out and the pharynx picks up the food and it brings it back. So they have the mouth. And then they, um, worms are hermaphrodites. So they have both male and female sex organs. And so you have both then, both pores there for that. Uh, the clitellum is instrumental in reproduction. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute um, because it is gonna pick up the eggs, the ova and the sperm packets, spermatophores. And so they move through the soil. Like I said, they don't have legs, uh, but they do have these little bristles, this set eye on them. And so those anchor them, and then they expand where all those segments are, and they kind of push forward a little bit, and then they contract and pull the rest of their body up. So they don't move very fast, uh, at least below ground, and they don't necessarily move very far. So I think I was reading that the average migration of an earthworm is just a few yards a year. Um, but nonetheless, they, they do a lot of good stuff. So internally, like I said, I talked about the mouth. Uh, they do have a small brain, which basically gets sensory type signals and has to do with locomotion. Uh, you know, there were a lot of questions on various sites about whether or not earthworms feel pain. And I think they say, well, you know, they obviously, they have sensory organs, so they do react when something happens, but they don't have any way to remember something like that happened. Uh, so I think that, you know, they were saying, no, they don't really feel pain because they don't recognize pain. But, you know, who do I, who do we know? Uh, but I remember when I was dissecting, one of the things that was interesting to me at that time, we called them hearts. Uh, when I was looking, you know, reading up on it here recently, some resources still call them hearts, some call them aortic arches, some call them something else. But basically, they still serve the same purpose, which is to move blood through the body. So they basically have two vessels, one on the top and one on the bottom that moves it through there. So their mouth, when they're out looking for food, they eat organic food pharynx pulls it in. The gizzard is what actually grinds it up. It's just like a gizzard on a chicken, okay? And so that's where they grind up the food. Everything else is intestines all the way down to where they excrete it through the anus. So a few little things. Uh, no, worms don't have eyes. They don't need them below ground, but they do react to light. And so, you know, obviously they don't necessarily want to get into the sunshine. Although I was reading something that they, they like the sun and they will seek out the sun uh, as long as it's not too hot. Uh, they breathe through their skin, which is why, you know, when you pick up a worm, they're kind of slimy because that helps retain the moisture so they don't dry out. Uh, but then, you know, the transfer happens through their skin, the oxygen, they don't have lungs. Uh, they do have receptors. So when we talk about things like taste, they don't really taste necessarily, but they, they can recognize various chemicals in the ground. And so they, they do react to chemical stimulus. But what I thought was interesting is that, you know, worms can live, earthworms, your basic night crawler, can live for about six years. They said it could be, you know, four to eight years, but six seems to be about the average. There are some worms that in, in other countries that they think uh, may well live longer but six years seems to be about typical for earthworms. So that was kind of a surprise to me. I, I really didn't think that they would last that long, but. Okay, so back to worm reproduction. So like I said, worms are hermaphrodites, but you still need two worms for sexual reproduction. 
So some of us have probably seen the two worms stuck together and they're exchanging spermatophores. Okay, the spermatophore is a little packet of sperm. And so they're, they're trading those off. Some species of worms can self-fertilize. Okay, so the male and female, or they can be what we call parthenogenetic, which means a female can basically reproduce herself into other females without the sperm being involved. Okay, uh, so some species that's possible, but for the most part, we're still talking about a um, sexual reproduction process. So what happens is okay. Now they've exchanged their little spermatophores. The clitellum starts packing in nutrients. It gets, you know, it's all mucousy, and it will slide down towards the head of the worm. It picks up the ova first, because that's the first little place they come to. So they pick up the ova, which at this point are not fertilized. They go down and they pick up a little package of sperm, the spermatophore, and then it slides off over the worm's head, and then it seals up, and it makes a cocoon. And then the sperm fertilize the ova, and we have embryos which grow until you know they eat up all the nutrients in the cocoon. Cocoon kind of dries up, and then it splits open, and the little baby worms are released. Okay, um, how long does that take? Well, it could be three weeks, it could be five months if the weather is good, if it, you know, the moisture is the right level, the temperature is the right level, it tends to go a little faster. If the environment's not good, it could take longer. But basically the cocoon helps keep everything from drying out and protects uh, the embryos while they develop. So anyway, that's what they look like. They're Depending upon the species of worm, these are about the size of a head of a pin. Uh, so when you look at your compost later, you can kind of look for them. You can find them in there. They're big enough to see. There could be in there, you know, two embryos, or there could be a dozen embryos. It just depends. You just don't know. A lot just depends on what the environment is like, how many end up in there. So, you know, that was a little bit about the worm itself. So, the, but their environmental role is break, breaking down decomposing items. So, decaying leaves, of course, you know, other animals are taking part in that. Uh, fungi are taking part of that. So, it's not all the earthworms, but the earthworms help. They eat those little bits. That's part of the organic material that they eat. They break them down. They help aerate the soil so it doesn't get so compacted. So, the roots are better able to uh, get through the soil and the water can percolate down there. Uh, but they also help make nutrients more bioavailable. I'm going to talk a little bit about calcium later because it's an important part of the composting issue. But calcium, especially. So, those of us that are gardeners and you like to have your tomato plants, you've probably heard before, you know, put eggshells in where you plant your tomatoes because tomatoes are heavy calcium feeders. They're not the only plants, the garden plants, but tomatoes especially, you know, but there's still a lot of that calcium that's not really readily available to that tomato plant. But the worms, by, when they ingest that calcium, when they excrete their castings, the calcium is in a better form for plants to be able to pick up and use. They also are what we call nitrogen fixers. The, the worms themselves are not, but they have bacteria in their gut that fix nitrogen. And so as they're eating all these things, they also help nitrogen be fixed in the soil again to the advantage of the plants, okay? So, you know, worms are very important to uh, the environment. But there are some environmental issues with worms. You know, we say, oh, they're also awesome, but uh, there are some issues. Uh, of course, one is earthworms numbers in many places are declining, which if you want to keep a nice fertile soil is not a good thing. Um, the studies that I saw didn't necessarily say um, that they could prove that uh, herbicides, for example, 
uh, or insecticides were necessarily bad for worms themselves, but they did find that anything that, you know, makes the soil, I said lower acidity, but what I meant was, you know, as, as, as the soil becomes more acid, it's not a good thing. Uh, the worms don't like that. So uh, they did some studies and they did show in places where there was intensive agriculture, this was done in the UK, there were about 30 uh, earthworms per square meter. Where they were not, uh, where they were using more organic type agriculture, there were 450 per square meter. And so, you know, that's a big difference. So we wanna make sure that we have good soil and we're providing a good environment if you want worms in your garden or in your yard uh, to help make things better. Things are kind of tough here for worms anyway, because it gets so freaking hot, it's dry, and that clay soil when it compacts is not very earthworm friendly. Uh, but one of the areas where earthworms are becoming a problem uh, is with climate change. As the soil warms further north, earthworms are progressing further north and they are changing the environment on the forest floor because they are, uh, you know, grabbing all the leaves. I mean, worms can pretty well get rid of all the leaves on the surface of the ground within the year, okay? And so many of the northern forests have pretty deep layers of litter, uh, and the worms are eliminating that, which is changing some of the uh, environment for other uh, creatures that live there. So we'll have to see how that plays out. So, you know, one of the things that was always interesting when I was growing up, everybody always said, you know, if you cut an earthworm in two, you know, you're in the garden and you do the shovel and you got two halves of an earthworm, you know, that's fine, you're gonna have two worms. Well, that's not entirely true. Yes, the front half of the earthworm can regenerate the back half, okay? As long as you get all the major organs and at least some of the intestine, and you know they don't get the environment's good. They don't get dried out. There's no infection. They will indeed regenerate the rest. But the last, the back half is going to die. Okay, there's there's nothing there that's going to help that. So you know, but it's still interesting. I just thought I'd bring it up. But the reason you know we use worms for composting is because worms eat a lot. Uh, they are little eating machines. So they eat about a third of their weight every single day. And, you know, like I said, it's decaying leaves and roots, but they also eat living things, bacteria, protozoans, nematodes, you know, if it's smaller than them and they can get it in their mouth, they can eat it. Uh, they will also help eat decomposing remains of other animals. And, you know, if, if it's there, they're gonna try to eat it. So that's what makes them really good in, in your household composting. And their castings, are very rich in nutrients. Remember I said they're nitrogen fixtures, they make calcium more bioavailable. Well, all of that is there. And so a lot of people use worm castings in their garden and you get to make your own castings to put in your garden. Okay, so now that I've talked a little bit about the worms and why they're kind of cool all by themselves, let's talk a little bit about what we call vermiculture or vermicomposting, the verma is worm. Okay, so vermiculture is raising worms, vermicomposting is using worms to create compost, okay? So, you know, people have two reasons for doing vermiculture. They may be trying to raise bait to go fishing, or they may be just, you know, trying to recycle or compost their household waste. I have one of each. They both do good on the household waste. But you know, when I was doing this, my husband, I like the red wigglers myself, and I actually fish with red wigglers, but my husband is a diehard nightcrawler person. And so we had to have nightcrawlers. So I have one of each uh, that goes. Uh, and it doesn't really matter. The red wigglers are probably a little easier, uh, but either one will work. And so uh, it, depending on how you set them up, in addition to recycling your household waste, and getting worm casting for your garden, you can set up your worm bins in such a way that you can collect uh, what they call compost tea, which is basically the liquid runoff uh, from compost. 
I don't have mine set up that way, uh, but you can do that if you use a tiered system approach and use the compost tea to fertilize your garden. I don't do it that way just because uh, right now I've got them in the house and I don't want the smell. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like reducing the smell. If they're outside, then it's not a big deal. Okay, you can advance any time now. My slides are frozen up. There we go. So what do you need to compost worms? You need some sort of container. If you go out on the internet and you look around, you're going to see you can buy composting bins ready-made. And that's fine. I just don't see spending 60, 70, 100 bucks when I can make it a junk that I might throw away. So I, I tend to do it myself. But you can buy uh, composting bins and they are a little fancier and, and you know there's a lot of good things to be said about them but most any container will do. Uh, you need some kind of soil. I just want to go ahead and use potting soil because I kind of know where that's been. Uh, the coconut fibers are primarily to retain moisture and sand so that you don't end up with waterlogged stuff so it, it kind of just makes things a little looser and then a source of calcium now reading what other people who use worms for composting they'll say that the calcium is essential for the night crawler reproduction but red wigglers don't necessarily need it i just put it in everything i don't worry about it because then i don't have to worry, you know how much or whatever so here's basically mine. I've moved them into the house here recently when it froze. So the one on the left you see is pretty shallow. Okay, that's my red wigglers. Remember they're in leaf litter. So they tend to stay up near the surface anyway. And so I just had a little, I had one of these containers sitting around. Drill, you, you may or may not be able to see, but they've got holes drilled in the top. Okay, and then the other is an old cooler that we were gonna throw away. I don't know if you can see it, but it's got splits on the side. Inside, it was kind of bubbling because of the splits in the side. You know, you're getting air in there. So it was one that was probably going to make its way to the a transfer station at some point. But I said, you know, I'll use it for the worms. So that's my night crawler bin. It also has holes drilled in the top for air. So most, if you go out on YouTube and you watch videos of how to set up your worm bins, uh, most of them will say to do a double uh, stack so you would have like two of the same container on top of each other so that you know they water can drain out there are some advantages to that um, I just didn't do it so but it's entirely up to you this will work uh, you don't necessarily have to and, and I've seen some where they recommend like a triple stack uh, for various reasons those all work. This is just simple, so this is what I did. So here's what I did. Now, if you go out on YouTube and you watch the various videos, or if you read a lot of uh, books that tell you how to do this composting, a lot of them will say get you two buckets from the Home Depot, you know, those orange buckets, the five gallon jobbies, uh, drill some holes in one of them, sit it inside the other, and then rip up some newspaper, throw it in there, wet it down a little bit, put your worms in there, and throw in some you know leftover veggies or fruit or whatever you can do that i am not a fan and I'll, I'll tell you i'm not a fan because you know up until this year i was traveling a lot and when i'm gone nobody keeps that newspaper damp and newspaper dries out really quick and i would come home and all my little worms would be dried up husks so i don't do it because you've got to pay more attention and you've got to be sure that you keep that newspaper moist all the time. So, you know, yeah, you can shred up some newspaper and throw it in there, but I, I much prefer using the pot and soil, uh, the coconut fibers, the sand. Um, and these are not exact. This is, was the recommendation. So the, the coconut fibers, for example, can be pretty expensive. I put this picture here because I bought that bale on, um, on Amazon. And 
it is almost impossible to break apart by hand. So I ended up throwing it in a wheelbarrow and filling that wheelbarrow with water and it sucks up water like crazy. Then I could break it up and add it to the potting soil and the sand. Uh, the only bad thing was, is I didn't use nearly all of it and I still have a whole bunch of it and I had to wait forever for that to dry out. So I'd like have the top of it dry out and I'd put a little bit, you know, back where I'm storing it a little bit. But that bale right there would probably make enough for six or seven containers of worms. So if I ever want to set up another one, I have got plenty of this stuff available. Uh, but it does help, especially here uh, when it gets so hot, it does help retain moisture for the worms. So you don't have to water them as often. So since I've moved my worms in the house for the winter, uh, they could go back outside right now, but when I moved them in when it froze, uh, you know, it gets drier with the furnace on, and so it, it dries out. So adding a little bit to your worms every once in a while. But with that in there, I can go two or three weeks without having to worry about adding any water or worrying about moisture. And, and with the, just the newspaper, if I was gone for a week, I was probably gonna come home to dead worms. So like I said, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the newspaper approach, but if you've got time to check them every day to make sure everything's good, then that would be fine. It's a lot cheaper, certainly. Okay, so the worms. You can, of course, go to the bait shop and just buy a little container of worms. You know, you can buy a dozen or a couple dozen or 50 or whatever. They're pretty expensive per worm, but you can do it that way. If you just want a little five gallon bucket or something, that may be the way you want to go. Or you can go on online and you can order. Uh, I put Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. There are plenty of other places you can order. This is where I happen to order mine. Um, worms aren't cheap. So you're probably talking for 250 night crawlers, it's probably going to cost you 30 bucks. And that's for the worms. Then you got to pay for shipping. And since they're, you know, they're live and they got to ship them fast and all that, it, it you know, the shipping is almost as much as the worms. But uh, this place had a whole bunch of, when I was looking for the best place to order, this was the one that had seemed to have the most positive reviews when I was looking online and most likely have things arrive alive. Uh, and so that's where I ordered them from. So, um, but like I said, there's plenty of places out there you can order. How many you order just depends on what you want to do. I think I ordered uh, 250 night crawlers and 500 red wigglers and uh, when I started mine up this time. But you can definitely do smaller and just let them keep reproducing in your bins. So whatever you want to do. But that was one that it wasn't too expensive, but still was a decent number. And they come, they look a little uh, anemic because, you know, they've been traveling. Uh, and so, but they, they, you know, they get in there, they start eating and it, life is good. So let's talk about feeding your worms. So that's why we got them. We're going to compost our household garbage. Any fruit or vegetable for the most part, except you'll remember I said they don't like acidic soil. They don't like acidic things. So you don't want to put citrus in there. You can, but for the most part, I don't recommend citrus and Pretty much all of the, the things I have read or watched on the internet have said the same thing. Uh, small amounts probably isn't a big deal, but I wouldn't put a whole lot in there. Obviously, you don't put meat or dairy in there, not because they won't eat it, but because they tend to stink. <laughs> okay, so we don't want to put stuff in there that's going to smell. But fruits and vegetables, what, so what do you see here? You see what's left after it's been in my worm bin. So the one on the left, the yellow, is the little bit of very thin skin membrane left from yellow squash. The middle one is the fibrous material on the outside of a cantaloupe. And then the right is what's left of a, a potato peel. Okay. Uh, now, if I left those in there, probably at some point they would go away, but I just go ahead and throw them outside. Something else will eat them that is more, um, they like that. Now, I will tell you, my worms love bananas. And since I usually have bananas around for the grandkids and they kind of go to the, I love bananas, I eat bananas every single day to, I don't eat a banana all week and we get tired of banana bread. The worms love bananas. 
probably because they're nice and soft and squishy and have lots of um, water in them, but they love the bananas. But it doesn't matter what it is, any fruit or vegetable is fine. Uh, do you have to cut them up? Not necessarily. I, will, I usually at least kind of split it just to make it easy on them, but I have buried entire pieces of something that started to go off and I hadn't fed my worms in a while and I thought, yeah, I'll just stick it in there. So I have put in, you know, a whole tomato or a whole squash or whatever in there and they eventually eat it once they get started. So, you know, you don't have to chop it up. Some people do. Now, I will tell you that I tend to bury the whole thing under at least a layer of soil because it helps keep the bugs down and, and the smell. So, and, you know, I just cover it with a light layer of soil and that's fine. Okay, so what about the calcium? Eggs work great. I eat lots of eggs. I have eggs every morning for breakfast. So we have lots of eggs. Uh, like I said, people say that it's essential for the night crawlers. I don't know whether it is or not, but I throw it in there. I also put it in the red wigglers. For me, this is just kind of a way station before it goes on the garden. So look at this egg. You can kind of halfway see down there in the bottom, you see that membrane? That's the albumin. You want to be sure you get that out. Okay? So when you first break your egg, you dump your egg out, what, you know, use it however you're going to, then I rinse it out and I make sure I get rid of that membrane. That's because I'm going to throw it in a, you know, a bowl or something and I save it up until I have a bowl full. So one, it, it makes sure it's clean so it's not attracting critters. Uh, but when I get enough of them, I scrunch them up. And the first thing you do is you put them in the microwave for three minutes and you cook them. If you have not taken that membrane out, your house is going to smell like rotten eggs. You do not want that because the smell stays forever. So I'm pretty careful about making sure I get that out of there. So you microwave it for three minutes. You're basically just making sure there's no harmful bacteria on there. Um, and so once I've done that, I just dump them in the blender and grind them up. It does create a very fine dust, and it's never a good thing to inhale dust into your lungs. So I do know some people wear a mask when they're doing it. I don't, I just don't stand on top of the blender. Okay, it's got a, it's got a lid on it, um, but I make sure it kind of settles down before I open it up. So I grind it up to dust and then I just stick it in a mason jar and periodically I'd put some on my worms and, uh, and away we go. Uh, so that's pretty much all there is as far as the, the calcium feeding goes. But I try to put some in there every couple of weeks uh, and it disappears pretty quickly. Okay, so here's my worm bins. Uh, what I did was I just kind of turned, I told you they like bananas. So I had this banana buried and I there's that squash I stuck in there. Anyway, I just kind of pulled that up. That entire banana peel is full of worms. Uh, this one's the night, the one on the left is the night crawler and the one on the right is the red wigglers. Not that you can see the difference, but uh, there, I have lots of worms, in other words. I'm not having any trouble there. Okay, so feeding, you can feed as, as seldom or as often as it looks like they're eating. It just depends on how many worms you have in your bin and some degree on temperature. You know, if it's too cool, they don't eat as much. Uh, so you just kind of check them every once in a while. It looks like it's going away. You put a little bit more in there. Um, you do need to watch the moisture level. Uh, I just watered my red wigglers today, the one in the shallow uh, container, uh, because they were getting a little dry. So I just sprinkled some water on the top. Uh, and then the other, the night crawlers, probably because the container they're in, they're plenty damp. It'll be weeks before I have to put any water on them. Okay. But, you know, once a week is fine. Uh, what they say is for a standard household, 20,000 worms will recycle pretty much all of your vegetable, fruit and vegetable waste for a household. Um, I don't have 20,000. So, you know, I'm still composting some of it someplace else, but I still put uh, it goes through quite a bit of it in a week. Uh, they prefer a temperature somewhere in the range of 65 to 75, but they can deal with it as long as they don't freeze. 
which is why I brought them in. I had them sitting on a heating pad, but outside I had one of those indoor outdoor one you put in the dog houses and I set them on that, but it just, I don't know. I was just too afraid that the, I might still have some get to freezing temperature. Uh, they do not survive freezing temperatures. If it gets cold, they'll quit moving around, they'll quit eating, they'll quit doing anything, but they'll survive it and they'll come back when they warm up. I just didn't want to take the chance that they would actually get to freezing because they won't recover from that. Uh, now what happened in the summer? Because I had them outside all summer. They were in the shade uh, on our back porch, but they were outside in 100 plus degree weather. They don't like it. But I don't know if any of you get those food deliveries like Kello Fresh or Imperfect Foods or whatever. They ship them with those um, freezer bags in there, kind of those gel packs. You can put them in your freezer and you can freeze them. So what I did is when I got up in the morning and get by about 10 o'clock and start and get pretty hot, I would put one of those freezer packs in each of the bins. Okay. Didn't keep the whole bin cold, but it kept a section of it cool enough and all the worms would congregate underneath the, the gel packs. And then at night, I would take it off and I would throw it in the freezer to refreeze for the next day. So the, the red wigglers in the shallow bin, it has lots of holes. It did pretty well that way. My problem was the night crawlers because there wasn't as much, it's deeper and there's not as much evaporation. Those gel packs condense moisture out of the air and so my soil in the, the um, what you call it, cooler got a little bit too wet. Uh, so all I did was my husband put a big, um, uh, he had a big board thing and he stuck it out there in the back and I just dumped it out on top of it and covered it with screen so the birds didn't get my worms. Uh, but because they'll, they'll go down. So if they're not directly on the surface, then it's okay to evaporate some of that water. And I also kept that in the shade so that they wouldn't cook out there, but just to get rid of some of the water. Uh, but I would do that for you know a couple hours here and there just to kind of try to get rid of some of that water. So that, that is a problem if you're gonna keep them outside and you're trying to keep them cool. If you use that method, it could be a problem. Nothing to say you can't keep them in the house year round. Like I said, I've got them in the house now. They do not stink if you cover up the stuff with the dirt. Uh, and it also keeps the fruit flies from congregating if you keep them covered up. Uh, so now outside, I was a little concerned because we do have, uh, you know, rats, mice, possums, all that kind of stuff. And I was worried about whether or not they were going to eat all my worms. Uh, they didn't find them for whatever reason. I don't know why. Uh, of course, the night crawlers, that lid you know, a raccoon could have gotten it off, but I don't think anything else would have been likely to be able to get it off. But that, that sh shorter one with the red wigglers, uh, because when my husband drilled the holes in there, it kind of cracked the top. Something could have gotten in there and eaten the worms, but they didn't. I don't know why. Uh, so that would be one concern I would have if I was gonna keep them outside, is whether or not, you know, something was gonna find them and clean you out. Uh, one of the things I saw online a lot and I have read in different articles was, you know, worms can have salmonella. Seems to me everything can have freaking salmonella. I don't worry about it too much, but I know a lot of people do wear the gloves uh, when they're handling messing with their worm bins. And I do wash my hands right after I get done doing the worm bins just to make sure. So just be aware that cautionary is, you know, you could have salmonella in the worm bin. Okay, so you, uh, two resources. This little book on the left, The Earth M Moved, she's got a little bit about in there about vermicomposting, uh, but most of it is about worms just because they're cool. It's a little book, it's a little older now, but I love that book. I I've read it three or four times and it's just so interesting. Uh, but it's, it's really a nice little book. Uh, there are lots of videos out on YouTube. Some of them are very good, some of them, not so much, but you know, I watch one every once in a while just to be sure. There are like five different species of worms that are commonly used for vermicomposting. Uh, I didn't go to the African night crawlers because it's like, you know, I don't really want to bring imported worms, although our worms are 
European, but I, I just didn't feel like I wanted to take a chance on something else that's not normally here. I don't, I don't think I'm going to have them get away from me, but nevertheless, so I decided just to use the two. And then there were some others that, that other people do use, uh, but they seem to be, have, uh, be a little bit more sensitive or require a little bit more attention. And if you require attention by me, it's just not going to happen. So, you know, I prefer the, the ones that are a little bit more self-sufficient, I guess I should say. But yeah, there are lots of really good videos out there on YouTube. And that's pretty much it. That's everything I think you need to know about uh, vermicomposting. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them for you. Hey, Penny, you have some questions in the chat. I do. I wasn't looking at the chat. Let me go down here. Okie doke. Wire worms. Um, you know, I don't really know. I've never tried them, and, and they're not any that were mentioned in uh, any of the materials that I have looked at. So it could be you might give them a try and see. I just can't tell you for sure. Is there a difference between an earthworm and a nightcrawler? A nightcrawler is, is people use the terms interchangeably, but an earthworm has multiple species of which a nightcrawler is one. So the worm we normally talk about as a nightcrawler is that one that I mentioned at the beginning, the Lumbricus teratus, teratus, or whatever the heck it is. That's what we generally refer to as a night crawler. Um, but an earthworm has several different species. Um, and yes, a lot depends on where you are. I know when I was growing up back up in Indiana, um, you know, we'd go out at night with the flashlights, especially after a rain, looking for earthworms, and it, and you could get some really huge ones. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with just the conditions they grow under, but also different species are different sizes. So for example, those African night crawlers I was talking about that some people use for their worm bins, they are significantly larger than the ones that you find locally. So it just depends on, you know, I think species in, in one sense and in the other sense is, you know, um, the conditions. And then it's also how old they are, because an, uh, an earthworm will continue to grow uh, as long as it's alive until it gets to the point where it's getting old. So once it, it starts getting old, and it's past its reproductive life, then they kind of start shrinking up, kind of like we do, okay? You know, you, you get to a max height and then you start shrinking. So it's kind of the same thing, they'll get smaller. So it could be that, you know, when you were younger, you were out there looking for night crawlers and you, you had some that had been around for a little while. I don't know. So will worms work in a compost bin? Uh, likely, it, just, it depends on how hot your compost bin gets. Uh, a lot of people do put red wigglers in their compost bins, uh, but most of our backyard compost bins you know, they might get pretty hot in the center, but they're not hot all the way through. So, the, I mean, it's not like they have to be in the middle of the pile. They can be, and in the wintertime, they probably really like that warm compost bin uh, because it's keeping them from getting cold. So I do know people who put their, bin, their uh, red wigglers in the compost bin. A nightcrawler won't stay in a compost bin because okay, they're going to, they like to go deep, uh, but the red wigglers will. But yes, if it gets too hot, this won't be a good thing. But for most of it, it would just be they'd stay out of the center of that pile and they'd stay on the outer layers where it's a little cooler. Clay soil won't work. Eh, it's a little one. It, yes, it would, but I would still put things in there to kind of loosen it up. Uh, it's just hard for them to do their thing. But yes, clay soil does work. I mean, we have clay soils here and you find earthworms in them. I just think they don't like them as well. How cold is too cold for the worms if they can freeze? Okay. They don't like it when it's colder, but if it's in the upper 30s, they'll be okay. They're not gonna, they're not gonna eat much and they're not gonna reproduce, but they're not gonna die. But if it, they get down 32 and they freeze, they're dead. And you, they're not gonna thaw out and come back, okay? Uh, ordered worms once, and a, my poor letter carrier made a special trip to my house because the smell was so bad. Yes, um, 
summer, that's why it's so important to read the reviews. We used to have this happen a lot at Wild Bird Rescue too, and we'd order mealworms, especially in the summer, because if they get stuck on a truck, they don't get delivered real fast. If they get stuck on the truck, yes, it'll cook them. And so that's why, you know, Jim's Worm Farm does send them out with those gel packs in there and they ship them overnight, which is why it is so expensive. Okay, so when you get them, uh, they're not cooked. So I think the last ones I got from them did come in the summer. Of course, it wasn't 100 degree weather, but it was in the 90s. But said so they came overnight. It was labeled live and there were gel packs in there keeping them cool. And so, you know, in the summertime, that's a problem. I should tie the wonderful world of worms. <laughs> There's a hair in my dirt. I saw that. I just haven't read it. So I'll have to look for that one. Okay, any other questions? Those were the ones in the chat. Okay, well, thank you, Kay.